Hello and welcome to Our Lives, Beginnings and Always. This is part 5 now I think, or well it's part like 7 for me but it'll be episode 5. So, exciting news, we have the DLCs now, that's right. So we can actually play the entire game uh, completely in order, all at the same time, in the moment it was meant to be very excited. So first though, we are going to move on to Sandcastle, our next moment in step one. Here we go. Cove wasn't able to do many things that summer. When you, him, and Shiloh sat out on the shore line, one bright morning you could tell he wanted to be in the water. But there's no way he'd be able to swim anytime soon, not with his cast. Don't you just wrap them with plastic and you can do whatever? The wave washed a single shell to shore, glittering and blue, another reminder of the places he couldn't go. I guess yeah, it'd be harder to like swim versus when you're taking a shower or a bath. Not that any of this matters. <laughs> From what you'd heard about Cole's old life so far in teeny pieces and fragments, you could tell that he'd do anything to be able to get that cast off. The possibilities of what he might get up to made you anxious. You thought about how the summer last year must have been totally different from this, with his old home and his mom and dad. But now he was here, with you and Shiloh and Lizzie and everyone else, and he couldn't even go in the sea. This town wasn't bad if it had all your favorite things in it, but sitting there on the same beach you'd grown up on, you grown up on, you could understand that not everybody felt the same way about Sunset Bird as you did. You watched him from the corner of your eye quietly and finally said aloud what you had been pondering. I wish I could go in. The water? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. You're gonna be able to do it soon. He's so supportive. <laughs> He's adorable. Cole only sighed in response. Apparently soon wasn't soon enough. It's so pretty, the ocean. Hmm, and huge. There could be anything out there. Like mermaids. Yeah. yeah. Sweet. I wish you didn't have a cast. I don't really care. Swimming might be fun if we could. I'm fine on your land. Mermaids aren't real. Um. Ooh. Fine here on land. Uh. Mermaids aren't real. Shiloh gapped at you, but Cove just shrugged. Says you. Obviously not interested in hearing much more of your input on the situation. Cove came back to the water. But as he looked away, something about Shiloh's slow, careful movements caught his eye. Hey, are you building a sand castle? Sort of. I was only playing around while you were talking. I'm listening. Maybe I could too. I've only made big piles before. It's really nothing special. I'm sure I'll be good at it right away. <laughs> the best friend. <laughs> well, how did you? How do you do it then? Tyler's cheeks lit up. You could tell he was a little bit uncomfortable to have Ko's expected stare on him. I'll play too. I love making sand stuff. I've never really made one before. There's nothing else to do. Uh, keep with the yellow because I believe that goes... So from what I've seen, apparently blue is more casual and straightforward. Yellow is emotive and reactive. And then green is less certain or uncommunicative. And what I'm looking to do is for us to obviously like get along and to not end up indifferent. But that's so hard to figure out, and it seems like some of the nice options fit with like blue or green or something, but then apparently it's not the emotional whatever, so I don't know, maybe I'm thinking too much into it after having the explanation, but of like in the beginning of the colors, but I don't know, we'll see how it goes, hopefully it goes in the direction, I'm hoping it will, but I'm hoping to come back and check things out, I want to make sure we get every cutscene, every decision, and all the fun stuff, so we'll see. Okay. He puts his hands back to his seashells and sand and nods. I don't do a lot. I don't do a lot. Here's how I'd like to get a house started. Shiloh focusing more intently than you've ever seen him guided the two of you through his process. <clears throat> it didn't take long for the three of you to each have humble structures prepared. That's all kind of. You can do anything now. Like make it bigger, add some seashells, carve a pretty pattern. I bet you'll have great ideas. <clears throat> I'm gonna make it bigger. Mine is gonna be a real castle. Cool, this is gonna be a house. Looking at the base of your sand castle, you decide to make a house, a castle, a mansion. Uh, do a castle. It is a sand castle. Looking at the base of your hand castle, you decide 
to build a fancy castle. The better part of the next hour was spent focusing on your own work, the boys were the same. Even Shiloh didn't sneak as many peeks at everyone else as he usually did. He finished- wow, that is a better sand castle than I have ever built. <laughs> you finished shaping before either of them did, glancing up from what you'd built. It seemed you'd done- you got done so fast because they were already searching around for extra decorations. Shiloh had grabbed most of the really interesting stuff and Cove had a lot of shells. But there are still options. The first thing you reached for was a... I was like, I feel like how all these have colors as well as if there's such an emotional response to it, you know? Like, blue shell, green pieces of sea glass, red bottle cap, we'll go with some shells. It was the best fit for your castle, you decided. The blue color of it still reminded you of the clear water. So you tucked it away somewhere secure inside, barely poking out to make sure it didn't get lost. Pleased with your result, you finally took a proper look around that wasn't focused on the sand itself. Both Cove and Shiloh seemed super immersed still. You knew you could probably sneak a peek at either one's work. Checked out Carlos Santano, checked out Shiloh Sandcastle, got another look. Ooh, I don't know what's gonna happen, because I wanna be like in talk to Cove because it's kinda like the point, but it's also saying like maybe he won't like it if I'm in on his stuff and like Shiloh was excited. Uh, we'll go based on the colors. Shiloh's definitely the best one out of the three we've built the sand castles. His is also the smallest, but there are so many glittering debris and carved sand shapes all over the entire building that his effort was obvious. Shiloh's little house even had a teeny garden by the front door and another one in the back, all made up with petals and other bits of bobs. The silence was then broken. What's on top of you, Shiloh? You peek closer and discover something shiny sticking out of Shiloh's sand chimney. Oh, it's just a gum wrapper. It looks like smoke. It's good. That's smart. Yeah, I didn't think of that. I guess I don't see it. You should be an architect. Kinda looks more like a worm. Less uncertain. You should be- Why does it seem like that's less uncertain? Go. Yeah, I didn't think of that. You really know a lot about this. Shiloh smiled without a word. And that was that for the current topic. Jimmy, can I see what you did? Sure! Okay, so I'm hoping I made the better option here and he would have been like mad if I tried to like peek ahead or something. Who knows? He's a weird boy. <laughs> he began surveying your work. The castle you built was pretty impressive. All things considered, it had archways, tall walls, and even a little moat circle around. It's a little moat circling it. There are eight. <laughs> Astounding. You'd probably feel safe living there. Maybe your mom's for the queens. Shell just quickly decided to jump in the new conversation. Hey Jamie, what did you do? I made a castle. Shell didn't look so happy anymore. You both built castles? Yeah. Aw, oh, that's neat. How you guys matched. It's too bad we didn't all do it. Next time we should. Wouldn't that be boring? If something is the only one of that thing, that makes it special. Yeah, for sand castles and stuff. People too. My dad always says how everybody is their own man. A real individual. I don't think I'm very special. Aw, Shiloh. Why not? Nobody else is you. Shiloh simply shook his head. I'm not different. A beat passed between the two. Cove then looked down at his own work again. Oh, did I make the wrong decision? Like, what the frick? Poor Shiloh as well. He didn't seem to be bothered leaving the disagreement hanging there. Cove had other things on his mind. My dad tried to get me to make sandcastles the first time we came to the beach. I didn't want to. Co trailed off. Again, there was another moment of silence. Shiloh shifted and opened his mouth to say something, but Co spoke up before he could. He didn't think that he knew Shiloh was going to talk. Hey, do you know what happened to your mom's... when your mom's met my dad, Jamie? You blinked, not expecting the question. He thought hard. I wasn't there, they didn't tell me. I just remember what happened when I met your dad. Mr. Holden had been a weird stranger then. Well, he was still kind of strange. No other parent acted like him but you knew him better at this point. Now that you thought about it, it made a lot of sense that Ko's dad talked to him about people being unique. You were pulled from your thoughts when Ko continued. Oh, well I was there. I don't think my mom has met your dad. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she hasn't. Jimmy's parents and my dad met the same day I met her. I was gonna say what happened. Hey yo! Hey, 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 hey! Shiloh frowned to himself, ducking his head. His hat cast a shadow over his face. You could still tell he was upset at not being included in Cove's choice of topic. 
That was kind of boring for him, though. Giving people their own turn to say the things they want is important, too. What? I think Shadow wants to talk to you. Stay um... Like, I'm, I'm here for it, but it's okay to let... Ah, uh, we'll let him finish his story. Shadow could talk about stuff after Cope had a chance to share what he planned on. When we moved here, we didn't bring a lot of things with us. Only some stuff that would fit in the dad's car. Because I think he's got some stuff going on and he needs to talk and that'll bring us closer, so... We didn't even get a moving truck. I sat in there while dad brought it all inside. I didn't want to get out because I knew dad would make me look around the new house. I really didn't want to do that. I think too is like Bob hasn't gotten a lot of chance to talk and stuff, but I feel bad for Shadow, he's so cute. His lips twisted into the frown as he would call back. Then I saw your mom's. They were in a car too and we stopped at your house. I guess they were coming back from somewhere or something. My dad noticed, he waved his hand, then went over to the front of your house where he started to talk to them. I don't know what they said, I couldn't hear it. But he couldn't see me anymore since he was looking the other way. So I opened the car door and left. I wanted to get away and went behind the houses. I found those hills there, the ones where we met for the first time. Hmm. Cope nodded and stared at you. He stared back. He didn't go on to say anything more. Is that it? <coughs> Cope's brow wrinkled like he didn't understand what you were surprised. That's all that happened. Okay. Why did you want to tell the story if nothing happened? You really gotta get better at telling stories. That was a pretty bad story. Thanks for telling me. Um, thanks for telling me. You're welcome. Even if not much happened, you weren't going to complain about knowing the story. Shadow's mouth twisted into a scowl of disbelief, but he said nothing. Why'd you bring that up anyway? There was a slight shrug of closed shoulders. I was thinking about it because of the sand castles. Made me remember when I moved on here. Moved to here, Dad showed me the beach first before we went back to the car to unpack. He was really excited about it for some reason. Cole's brow furrowed a little more as he quietly racked his hands to the sand. I get it. You thought maybe Mr. Holden wasn't that excited about the beach and was instead hoping Cope might be. The line of conversation had come to its end. Even Cope was done with it. Some other topic had popped into his head. Shadow vision of crumpling the sand had made Cope aware of his presence again. They looked at each other and you could only wonder what this might be about. Hey Shiloh. Yeah? Why are you always turning so red, even when nothing's happening? <laughs> Clearly startled, he jerked back. Neither you or Shiloh had expected that to be how he included how he got included in the conversation again. I don't know, I guess. Okay, it's kinda weird. <laughs> Shadow's eyes were weird with wide with embarrassment and his lips twitched and he was blushing even harder than before. <laughs> You're weird. <laughs> well he's nothing if not direct. <clears throat> Maybe it wasn't only this, perhaps it was simply the last straw. But it was a big deal to Shiloh, a huge deal. He didn't look sad, he looked almost panicked. You weren't sure if he was about to cry or run away or what, but you soon got an answer. Why do you wear glasses? Most kids don't wear glasses, and nobody is named Cope. Who asked you to come? It was probably just your dad bugging Jamie's family some more because you don't have anyone else who will ever play with you. Um, oh, that's me. Cope blinked. The tension on the beach was suddenly uncomfortable in a way you didn't know how to even mention. It didn't seem like the kind of thing he'd get upset about, though you hadn't ever known what kind of thing would bother Shiloh. I'm sorry. Me too, I was just wondering. He was building our camp castle, you tried to play on your own. Uh, we're gonna build more? You're just a mess with Sam. You tried to play on your own. He shrugged not in the mood to work out their problem and started building another castle next to the first one. Both your playmates noticed immediately and turned away from each other. What are you doing? I'm gonna finish my next one before both of you. Child glanced at you, then at Cove, who had already started digging up more sand. Y'all went back to making more sand buildings, but the whole mood had changed. Shiloh's cheeriness was clearly gone, and Cove looked as confused as ever about why the other boy had blown up. The air stayed uncomfortable the rest of the afternoon, right up to the moment that Shiloh's mom appeared at the beach to take him home. Cove and Shiloh had mostly followed your lead and barely said a word. His mom standing behind him, even Shiloh's goodbye had been quiet. Friendly, cheerful, but noticeably quiet. But with Shiloh gone and the sun going down, you knew it was time for you and Cove to head to your own house. You followed him as he made his way out of the sand. The walk home was quiet. You passed by familiar landmarks, shoes, thumping against the sidewalk in near perfect unison. Cove was clearly caught up in thinking about something. Uh, ask me something. The process of asking made you nervous, but you did anyway. Hey, is everything, um, okay? Oh, I was just wondering. Cove fell silent again for more, for a few more seconds inside. Why'd Shadow act like that when I said he was all red a lot? 
you were being rude to him. He's just being a baby. You shouldn't make fun of him. I don't know. It's just Shiloh. He gets embarrassed. Distracted Kobe, no answer. I guess he gets embarrassed. Embarrassed? But I didn't say anything that bad. It might have upset him anyway? Hmm. Very articulate children, these people are. <laughs> I guess I can get it why he would do that. Sometimes they get really mad, too. Despite seemingly coming to a conclusion, Ko's mood was still sour. What Shiloh said didn't make sense anyway. Parents always talk to each other's parents and set up stuff so their kids can play together. My dad didn't do anything weird. He still not to make a face at him. His dad definitely did something weird to try and get you to spend time with Cove, but Cove didn't know that. Um. Oh, because I feel like I want to tell him, like, nobody's making me spend time with you, which is true, and but... Your dad does do stuff so you'll hang out with my family, but Shiloh shouldn't have said that. You decide to tell him about how his dad offered you money. Oh! Because I know that... I believe there's like a cutscene with it, but like... I don't know if it's bad, <laughs> you know? Like, I... and we tell the dad we wouldn't say anything. Oh, I hate this. What do we do? Oh no. Because, like, and to be fair, like, we weren't, we said no to the money. So it's not like we were being forced to hang out with him. Oh, Okay, I'm going to be a baby and go save over here. Okay, let's see. Because that's uncertain and unclear. Uh, I, like... Let me spend time with you. We'll see. Um, see what happens if we tell him the truth. Well, remember how you talked about how our parents met and I didn't know what happened? Yeah. I kind of had something happen that you don't know about when I met your dad. And you showed up on the right words, Cove looked at you passively. You wilted under his gaze, breaking eye contact, you stared at the floor. I was walking home and your dad was sitting up in the house. It must have been after you ran away. My moms weren't there either. I think they were looking for you. Your dad saw me, he got up and came over. Mr. Holden told me that he just moved into the house next to mine. Knuckles at Cove, he's still listening, his expression was plain as before. He paused for a moment, wondering if you should really keep going. You didn't tell what happened after that, you told the full story. Oh, now it's emotional, okay. You know it was supposed to be a secret, you thought Cove should still know. Your dad wanted you to have a friend, so he offered me money, $20. Cove was so still, you thought he hadn't heard you. Then his eyes widened, his mouth flung open, but no sound left him. Silence dressed between you so tense that it seemed almost tangible. You shifted from one foot to another and your hands tensed up. Cove, instead of speaking, he closed his mouth. His eyebrows bent up, crinkling his forehead. He looked more sad at the time now. He was going to cry you a certain way. I didn't take it, the money. I didn't want, honestly. Cove raised his hands and brought them up to his glass. His finger passed over his eyes, hiding them from sight. Then, right in the middle of the street, the tears began to fall. His shoulders shook with the force of his sobs. You could glimpse wetness through the cracks in his fingers slipping down his cheeks. You opened your mouth, but you had no idea what to say. Step closer, you placed a hand on his head. He touched his shoulder, you stayed by him. Uh, place your hand on his head. I'm sure you slowly placed your hand on top of his head. Your mommy did that for you sometimes. The coach shook his body from side to side, rejecting your presence. Go away. He flinched with a shout. As you stood there listening to him cry, you felt... Uncomfortable with the scene he's making, concern for him, regret for telling about the money, bad about everything. Ugh, I'm concerned for him. You didn't want Cove to be upset, you just wanted to be honest. Cove continued to weep with his face covered by his hands. Worse, he raised his voice and volume and froze in place. The situation was awful, he kept feeling worse every second. I'm sorry, Cove, you hugged him. You started to cry too, stop being loud. Oh, please don't cry. Your voice is weak, he wondered if Cove even heard you the noise he was making. From the way his shoulders shook and his tears screamed to drip as he didn't think he did. You hear a door open and flinch, expecting to see a mean old man parent preparing themselves to yell at you. At this hour, most people weren't around, either be because they were working or down in the town, but the grandparents rarely left the house, except to complain at children making noise in the street. With the ruckus Cove was making, you could kind of understand why they might have objections, even if he couldn't help it. But the door that stood open now didn't belong to the grandparents. To your utter surprise and relief, it was Cove's own. His dad was already home. As he peeked out the door, Mr. Holden momentarily looked unsure. Perhaps he had suspicions on the noise outside, but wasn't entirely positive. Though a kid crying is pretty distinct, and there aren't a lot of kids. Maybe he didn't want to believe something might be wrong with his son. His face fell as he spotted the source of the commotion. 
It was pained and it was scared and it reminded you of the one he'd worn the first night you met Cove. Mr. Holden didn't go down the steps of his house, he just jumped right over them and stumbled into a run. He skid to a stop before Cove, bent down on one knee and then solidly covered Cove's teary face with his hands. Are you hurt anywhere? Cove continued to cry, unable or unwilling to cough out an explanation. Not taking his hand from Cove, Mr. Holden turned to you for an explanation, his eyes wide and imploring. He wanted to know if you tried to make me hang out with him. I told him about the money. As he spoke, Mr. Holden's chest froze while he inhaled a deep, shaky breath, accumulating in a gas for your final worlds. Why? Why would you- He clamped his mouth shut, shaking his head, face crying son. No, it's my fault. I shouldn't have done something like that in the first place. He cast his eyes down, sighing. When he next spoke, it wasn't part of the conversation anymore, and very loud enough for you to catch his words. Jamie's only a kid. They were still streaming down- Oh, smiled sadly, Mr. Holden wiped his cheeks. Oh, he felt his brow and looked at the ground. When he next looked up, his mouth was set with determination. Mr. Holden finally took his hand from Cove, he reached for his wallet, confused. You stare at a little rectangle that all adults seem to carry in the shape or form. It has source of all their problems. You were sure that Cove wouldn't want to be reminded of it right now. It was clearly of a different mind of view. He inexperiently retrieved another $20 bill, rolled it up, and raised it to Cove's face. Cove's eyes were hidden behind tightly clamped fingers, so Mr. Owen poked the nose for the bill. Cove peeked between his hands and grunted as he saw he had what he had been propped with. Even if it was surrounded by sobs, we were glad that something else had finally left Cove's mouth. Hey Cove, can we stop crying? I'll give you this cash if we do. Cove dropped his hands from his face. It was already been red and wet with tears, but now his features were scrunched up in a scowl. Not for the first time he questioned Mr. Holden's tactics. He had to use two hands, but Cove finally shoved his dad's own hands away. But Mr. Holden just chuckled at Cove's reaction and tossed the money aside, and then furled and flew in the air, rising before slowly dripping to the floor. <coughs> Mr. Holden took Cove's outstretched wrists and lowered them to Cove's side, stopping it from hiding his face once again. Cove's dad clearly wasn't going to let go. Huffing, Cove turned his whole head away, tears had faded to roll down his cheeks as he glowered at the ground. You can buy a lot of cool things with that, but it can't do everything, can it? Cove didn't respond, not even to look at his father. Mr. Holden continued. Your old dad likes to make things nice for you with money he earns, but you're smart. You know that I haven't really done anything. I still make you sad and upset, just like right now. I'm sorry. Jamie is smart too, right? Mr. Holden spoke in a soft, encouraging tone and Cove continued to calm. You have nothing to worry about, except for me. Mr. Holden chuckled. Cove pressed his lips together, mulling over his father's words, so the stream of tears had eased. The drops still buttered in his eyes and threatened to spill out. I love you, son, so much. More than anybody else. Sometimes, sometimes it makes me a little too hasty to see you happy, and I make it all worse. I really am sorry. Grunting his eyes tight, Cove nodded. When his eyes opened again, the red and glossy, they were red and glossy, but there were no tears left on the precipice of his lower latch. Aside from the occasional sniff, he was mostly back to his usual self. He swallowed. Okay. Though Cove had refused to echo Mr. Holden's exact words, the sentiment seemed to be enough for his dad. He moved his hands up under Cove's armpits and hoisted Cove high into the air with a grin. Cove's hands flew to his grasses, holding them back from falling off. Cove's lips were shut tight, all betraying the telltale sign. Telltale smile in his eyes that he was trying hard to hide. Oh, I hope this ends up being good for both of them that we did this and then they had this talk. So it seemed really bad at the beginning, but like it ends up being kind of important. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> Mr. Holden laughed, lowering Cove so that he securely pinned against his chest. Cove looked away, face angled to the ground. Now that his dad could no longer see him, he allowed himself a smile. Mr. Mullen might have missed it, but you didn't. Cove wriggled, pushing a hand against his dad's shoulders. Can I go back now? Yeah. yeah. Mr. Holden checked Cove gently on the ground, waiting until his feet found their footing before releasing him entirely. I have to do something. Wait here. As Cove wandered away, Mr. Holden's gaze stuck to him like glue. He sighed, eyes downcast. You felt weird that you'd been that you'd only been able to stand there while the event unfolded. You weren't able to fix it. I couldn't do anything. Don't worry about it, please. We don't need another tragedy today. He winked and you weren't impressed. Hey, I mean that. The first part, anyway. There's only so much you can do to try and fix someone else's mistake. He smiled sincerely at you. You've done plenty for Cove. Just the fact that you were honest with him when his own dad wasn't proves it. Thanks for being such a good kid. I hope we'll keep spending time with the boy. I hope that's the case and that, like, being honest was good. As though the sound of his name summoned him, Cove returned, clutching the bill his dad had cast aside earlier. Cocked her head and Cove's dad raised his eyebrows. Cove looked at you and crumpled, and the crumpled note, then walked over and held it out to you. I stopped crying, but I don't want this. You can have it. He gave you a small smile. 
Behind him, Mr. Holden was still watching Cove closely, clearly relieved. He shared the feeling. Cove's making peace with the deal that happens behind his back. He decided to take it. He told me to. Shaking your head, you pushed a note back to Cove. I don't need it. But I don't want it. You were at a stalemate. Mr. Holden hummed thoughtfully, tapping his head. He gazed up at the wide sky. It's planned to give the conundrum serious consideration. I know. Plucked a bill from Cove and tore it right in two. You and Cove gasped in unison. Dad! We can't do anything with it now. True, it won't work at the store like this, but now you can split it. Crouching down, he held up the pieces to you and Cove. You both looked at the two halves, neither of you reached for them. It still has value, as a keepsake, a memory, and that's one of the most valuable things you can use money on. That sounds pretty good, huh? Maybe I'm getting smarter. Wordlessly, Cove stretched out a hand and took his half. You took yours, running a finger along the jagged edge of the bill. Oh, this is actually nice! Thank God! I think it was the right thing to do. <laughs> because I would have been so heartbroken if it wasn't, but this seems really cute. Mr. Holden stood up, stretching his arms out casually. Well then, it's about time for dinner. Me and the Rugrat need to be going. You probably should too. I bet your moms want to see you. Alright. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Have a good night, and thanks, Jamie. Father and son waved at you as they turned and dashed back home. The note clenched tightly in your hand. You felt lighter. Oh, thank God. I hope that note was good. <laughs> no. <laughs> Alright, so we will make that our next part. I believe video for Sandcastle. Hope you enjoyed it. I love this one. This is, I really got into it, which is why I ended up loving this game. I feel really into it, and I really like these choice-based games where you really have to, like, decide what you're going to do, and it always, like, tears me up inside, and it's awful, but it's great. <laughs> so, I hope you're sticking with me for the drama, for the fun, for the slice of life that it is, and I will hopefully see you guys in the next 